Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tahoe Silicon Mountain's Mountain Minds Monday. This month's event, Lake Tahoe Backcountry Skiing, How to Get Started, and we've got an all-star panel. Um, take note of the email address at the bottom of the screen, megan at tahoesiliconmountain.com, if you want to start getting your questions in, or you can type in your questions in the YouTube comments. Tahoe Silicon Mountain generally has two monthly programs and two annual programs. Um, Mountain Minds Monday is our flagship event. We've been having that the second Monday of the month for over 10 years. This is our speaker series. I encourage you to go back through our YouTube channel and see some of our past presentations. And if you're missing out on meeting people, especially some of you who've recently moved to the Truckee area, you can see the introductions where everyone who attended the live events introduced themselves so you get an idea of who all's around. Our other monthly event is an entrepreneur's round table that happens the first Friday of the month at four o'clock here at the lift where we're broadcasting from. Because it's an in-person close event, we are on hiatus as we're in, um, continue to be dealing with the pandemic. As I mentioned, Mountain Minds Monday happens every month, the second Monday of the month. We have not yet published the speaker for next month, but um, be, rest assured it's something you're gonna wanna see. So I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. The second Monday in December is the 14th. And so that'll be at 5 p.m. Pacific. In addition to signing up for the YouTube channel, we do encourage you to sign up for the email newsletter. We only send a few emails per month leading up to the event and reminding you when the event is happening. Um, also encourage you to join our Facebook group if you're a Facebook user. Um, you'll also get reminded of the event there and have an opportunity to engage in conversation with other members of the Tahoe Silicon Mountain community. We do ask for a donation of $5 for those of you who are participating in our virtual events. Um, the way that you can go ahead and make that donation is if you go to tahoesiliconmountain.com in the upper right, there's a donate button. And um, that's the way I got on a monthly program of donating. Um, there, there are some ongoing costs even when we're meeting virtually since we are an official 501c3 and 100% volunteer led. So um, we do encourage you to make that $5 donation if you can. As I mentioned, all volunteer led, these are the five members of our volunteer board. We're always looking for help and eagerly looking forward to scheduling events um, right after we are able to meet in person again. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors who've been with us for a long time. Our gold sponsor is Holland and Hart Law Firm. Our silver sponsor is also a law firm, Mobo Law. Our community partners include Nevada County Tech Connection, Tahoe Trekkie Media, the Trekkie Tahoe Airport, Lyft Cowork Space, where we're broadcasting from today, the Trekkie Chamber of Commerce, and Tahoe Donner, who hosts us for our in-person Mountain Minds Monday when we're back to meeting in person. If you'd also like to become a sponsor, um, you can reach out to sponsorship at tahoesiliconmountain.com or use that bit.ly link on the screen. So without further ado, I'd like to get started on our panel. So, um, probably seen the press release or seen, uh, seen the article on our website. We're going to be talking all about backcountry skiing and some of the things those of us who are newbies might be interested in and how to get started. So our panel is made up of Athie, Andy Rathman from the San Francisco Backcountry Skiers Facebook group, David Rochelle from the Sierra Avalanche Center, and Emily Hargraves from Backcountry Babes. And I will point out one more time while it's on the screen, you can email Megan without an H, M-E-G-A-N at tahoesiliconmountain.com to get your questions in, or you can type it into the YouTube comments. So our first presenter today is going to be Emily Hargraves, Chief Executive Babe and owner of Backcountry Babes. And 
Emily loves the spirit of outdoor adventure travel and especially loves sharing it with others. She finds our women's trips have a special power to foster camaraderie, confidence, creativity, freedom, education, and fun. Emily brings a background of leading adventure travel trips for 10 plus years. She's grateful to be working on the leadership team at Backcountry Babes, humbled by the beautiful energy of our educators and students, and proud to be building a framework for more women to become leaders in the outdoors. She's an Airy Avalanche course instructor and has completed the AMGA ski guide course. She lives in the Northern Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Emily, let me know when you want me to advance your slides. Okay, uh, great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I run Backcountry Babes, which is a ski guiding service and an Airy Avalanche course provider. So we teach a lot of three-day avalanche courses. Um, actually, a few years ago, I took my Airy Level 2 with David Reichel, who's one of the panelists. So i um, super excited to be here um, presenting today. And what I thought I'd present on today is just what is backcountry skiing and splitboarding? Uh, it's a question I get a lot from people who are avid skiers who maybe have never been actually backcountry skiing. Um, and so I'll find myself explaining, no, it's not cross country skiing. Um, and then try to explain what backcountry skiing is. So um, next slide, please. So what my parents uh, think backcountry skiing is, is you know, this extreme event where you'll probably die. Um, my sister was like, so like, at what point do you jump out of the moving helicopter? And um, we never jump out of a moving helicopter. Uh, that's a stunt that's happened a couple of times in films. Um, so I think like the, the backcountry skiing films that we watch are, you know, really calculated with pro athletes doing a lot of shots and waiting for the perfect weather window and doing lines in Alaska that are 50 degrees. Um, and so uh, what we really do is more, uh, you could come to the next slide. So this is really more what we do. These are like 25 degree slopes, cruiser powder. Um, most days in the backcountry, this is what normal, you know, non-film actors are doing. And so it's a little more similar to a walk in the woods um, than an extreme event. But that being said, you can certainly like step out and do more, more calculated risks as you want. Um, so while backcountry skiing certainly has its hazards, like avalanche accidents, um, these risks can be managed. So um, next slide, please. Um, so for the high level overview, first you go up uh, and then you go down. But you can see that traveling uphill in this photo on the left, uh, this is New Hampshire. And these women are using backcountry skis with touring bindings so they can lift their heels, similar to cross country skiing. And underneath they have skins on, which is sort of like a carpet um, that you can rip off at the top of the hill. Um, usually you're wearing like a baseball hat and sunglasses, but it looks really cold in New Hampshire. So people are really layered up um, on that trip. Um, and then over on the other side of the screen, you can see people booting up. So when it gets a little bit steeper, you may boot pack up. And yes, we do use helicopters sometimes to take our luggage to a lodge and then we tour from the lodge, but we're not jumping out of it. It's landing, we're walking out. Um, and so you can go back and skiing with a helicopter, but that's a lot of money and a lot of fossil fuels. So um, you must love hiking. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, um, here we are hiking in Japan. So super nice way to travel and explore a landscape. So starting down in the forest, sheltered snow. And when you get up higher above tree line, you might see a lot more, you know, wind buff. And so it's just a really cool way to experience the landscape. Um, so you, you have to love hiking because you're gonna spend most of your day hiking and then uh, go down. As my sister says, you know, you call that fun. You spend all day hiking uh, to go down once, which yes, <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, so next slide, please. This is this is the going down. That's our ski, one of our ski guides, Chika in Japan, um, skiing some powder. And benefits are deep, untracked powder all to yourself on some days. Quiet time in nature, no rushing, and uh, you can lap it 
as many times as you want, as long as you have legs and daylight. Um, next slide, please. So um, yes, there are hazards. And so if you're trying to avoid um, putting yourself in avalanche terrain, it's really good to learn how to recognize avalanche terrain. So an avalanche course is good for that. Um, and the avalanche bulletin and forecast is another way to tie in the weather and current conditions to help you shape that. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of really good information on that. Um, and that is the, that's the super zoomed out overview of what backcountry skiing is. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Um, our next speaker is going to be David Reichel, Executive Director of Sierra Avalanche Center. I'll give you a little personal background on him because I'm sure he's going to cover the information about the Sierra Avalanche Center itself. So um, as soon as possible after UC Berkeley, David moved to the mountains. He took his first avalanche course that winter in the Rockies, and he's been exploring snow-covered peaks ever since. Back home in the Sierra, he's taught a bazillion I'm sure that's a technically accurate term, bazillion airy courses and split boarded all over Tahoe. And actually it probably is because as, as you heard, Emily took a course from him and so did I. Um, David also guides and instructs avalanche courses in Mount Shasta and Argentina. In 2014, he founded the California Avalanche Workshop. I think I attended one of the first of those. When not outside, David's professional experience includes starting a charter school for at-risk young adults running an academic college wilderness program, directing a small nonprofit, and working to get more kids on bikes. So David, maybe you'll speak a little about Sierra Avalanche Center as you launch into your slides and let me know when I should go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Cool, so um, Emily's talk's a really nice uh, introduction to what I'm gonna talk about. Like backcountry skiing's awesome. You have to walk uphill, but that's fun. And then you get to go downhill, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and one of the big differences between resort, you know, skiing or riding is that there's no fork, there's no patrollers, right? There's, there's the risk mitigation hasn't occurred. So kind of the first part of the daily ritual for backcountry skiers is to check the forecast. And, you know, in order to be able to check an avalanche forecast, you need to have one. And that's where the Sierra Avalanche Center comes in. So, you know, I've guided in Argentina and Japan and places where there may or may not be a forecast or um, accessing it might be really difficult. I mean, even, you know, in Nevada and rural parts of Nevada, you know, there may not be a forecast available to you. Uh, but, you know, here in the greater Lake Tahoe area, we have uh, the Sierra Avalanche Center forecast. So um, the Sierra Avalanche Center itself is a partnership between a nonprofit and the Forest Service. And we create a daily avalanche forecast every uh, morning in the winter published at 7 a.m. Just really quickly, you know, what you see on the screen is what the forecast is. It's much richer if you go to our website for real, but this is a quick overview of it. There's a two or three sentence bottom line where we kind of tell um, people what's going on. There's the uh, a hazard rating on this particular day I chose from last season. It's moderate um, in terms of the danger scale, uh, below tree line, near tree line, and above tree line. Um, it could, you know, obviously it varies. It's just, you can have low avalanche danger and you can have high and extreme. Uh, and then we also talk about what the avalanche problem is. You know, is it a wind slab? Is it a persistent slab like in this example here? So you know, the forecast is really the starting point for everyone's daily um, trip planning uh, and following the, the forecast, even when you're not, you know, planning to go out is really helpful for when you do, you know, the weekend arrives or your, your, your day off arrives and you can get out. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Sweet. So how do we make the forecast? How does the Sierra Avalanche Center create the forecast? We lean heavily on our professional field staff. Uh, this is Steve Renault, one of our um, professional forest service forecasters in, uh, based out of Truckee. Uh, the Tahoe National Forest Truckee office is the sponsoring Forest Service uh, field office. So all three of our forecasters are based out of that office, but they travel throughout the greater uh, forecast area. So, you know, uh, half an hour north of Truckee to two or three hours south of Truckee, all the way down to Bear Valley technically is the southern tip of our forecast zone. So this is Steve, who's a very highly trained, experienced snow nerd, and he's digging a pit. He's looking at crystals on a, a card, and he's, you know, um, gathering observations today to inform tomorrow's uh, forecast. And so we have three forecasters. Uh, we have two-ish professional observers. I think we might have three this season. Um, and those are the paid professionals that uh, contribute um, observations that inform the daily forecast. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. 
Sweet. And so in addition to the professionals, we also get observations submitted to us from the public. Obviously, on any day, there's maybe three professionals paid by the Sierra Avalanche Center, three or four in the field. But we all know there's thousands of people in the backcountry in our forecast area. So this was an observation submitted last year uh, during that same time period as what the uh, forecast example that I showed on the first or second slide. And so we had a persistent slab problem here. And this is a uh, snowmobile access area out in Carson Pass zone. And if you can tell this sno uh, snowboarder just you know, had this sweet line where he followed a couple of friends who've already done this line or maybe he did it previously, I don't really know. Um, but upon landing uh, below those cliffs, like he triggered a slide and you can see it just beginning in this photo. You can see the cracks of the crown um, spreading out. And so this is a sequence that was submitted. It was really amazing. This snowboarder luckily stuck to landing, rode away and just had incredible photos to share, but super valuable observation that like you couldn't pay our forecasters to do themselves um, and is highly dangerous, but getting observations like this from the public is, is really, really helpful, right? We were monitoring this sort of tricky avalanche problem during this time period. And this person had a close call and shared it with the greater public and really helped make the forecast better, um, you know, because of this observation. So observations from the public don't have to be this extreme. They can just be a, a photo of wind affecting snow or all kinds of different things. But this is an example of a, a publicly um, sourced observation. Next slide, please. Okay, so how does this year Avalanche Center work? Again, it's a public um, profit, public nonprofit partnership. And uh, the operations are sort of housed within the Forest Service. I just covered that. We have three forecasters that are Forest Service employees. One of them also um, wears the hat of being the su supervisor. And then we have three professional observers. On the nonprofit side, there's a volunteer board of directors, advisory board, executive director, myself. Um, we provide avalanche awareness classes, perhaps not this season so much, although we did, um, we've done a few things online. We have free motorized avalanche courses for the snowmobile motorized community because there's no guide services that have permits for motorized courses in our area. And, you know, it changes year to year, but the motorized community makes up a significant portion of fatalities nationwide from avalanches. We also offer avalanche class scholarships. Um, and the deadline for that is maybe five or six days out. So if anyone wants to get an application in for this season, uh, please do so. And, you know, the big thing that the nonprofit does is raises money to support the operation. So, you know, we fundraise changes year to year, but about two thirds of, you know, the forecaster salaries and the operations for all the, the observers and all the other um, functions of the Avalanche Center. And go ahead and go on to the last slide, I think. Sweet. And this is us, SierraAvalancheCenter.org. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And my email is there if you have any questions that aren't answered during this talk. That's what I got. Great. Thank you for the introduction, David. Our third panelist is Andy Rathburn of, sorry, I always put an R in there, Andy Rathburn of the San Francisco Backcountry Skiers Facebook group. He's one of the moderators and one of the administrators of the group. Um, so he, he does this moderating on a volunteer basis along with the ski EO, Bob Shattuck, Carl, I will never pronounce Carl's last name, um, <laughs> Alyssa and Tom. In a usual year, Andy's role is hosting a monthly happy hour in San Francisco and maintaining a calendar of other meetup activities. Andy grew up in Ohio and started skiing at the age of 12. As a kid, he was inspired by a ski magazine story of climbing and skiing Mount Shasta in June. His curiosity for the backcountry grew out of that article. When he isn't skiing, Andy works as a geologist researching the generation of earthquakes and how materials deform in the earth. This work has taken him around the world, including living for two and a half years or three ski seasons in the French Alps and the last eight years in San Francisco. And so I'll let him touch on exactly the history of the group and what the group is through his slides. So um, Andy, if you wanna unmute yourself and tell me when to advance the slides, please. All right, thank you, Ellen. Uh, so San Francisco Backcountry Skiers is an internet community that we host on Facebook, and there's a large team of people involved. I'm just one of those. Um, I tend to stay in the background, but as Ellen said, in most years run uh, a series of meetup activities to try to get people together, uh, which is what San Francisco Backcountry Skiers is all about. 
Um, if you live in Truckee or Myers or South Lake Tahoe, it might be easier to find ski partners. But in San Francisco, there are quite a lot of outdoor enthusiasts and skiers, but it's a little harder to run into each other and, and meet up. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, some history. So ski EO Bob Shattuck is uh, trying to ski on Baker Beach there on the, the bottom left uh, in a, a training run. There's not really any skiing in San Francisco, but there are a lot of skiers. On the right, you can see the breakdown of sort of the, the top 15 or so uh, places of people that belong to the group. It is San Francisco dominated, uh, but you can see there are uh, folks spread throughout the state and country and even internationally. Bob started the group in uh, 2015, really as a means for carpooling uh, and getting to the mountains together. Uh, so one thing we run is a, a weekly, in most years, a weekly post uh, for carpool and partner finding uh, for getting to the mountains, whether it's Tahoe or Lassen or Shasta, Eastern Sierra, wherever people might be going. Um, it is an open group available to all skiers, riders, uh, snowshoers, uh, sledders, et cetera. Currently, we have about 3,300 members. Facebook considers uh, about 2,300 of those to be active. Uh, we're primarily in the Bay Area, but all are welcome, uh, whether you're in the Bay Area or not, or what your mode of winter travel is. Next slide, please. Uh, it's member-driven content and discussion. I just pulled some numbers off. The point of the group is really to put people in touch with each other. Uh, our October average is about five posts a day um, and 42 comments a day with 77 reactions. Our top post in October was 1800 views. So the point of this uh, round table was new to the backcountry. That's probably our most common question is how to get started in the backcountry. And you can see just from this, a lot of people see that question. Uh, there's lots of feedback on it uh, and people are providing a lot of resources. Uh, the membership in the group ranges from having never been in the backcountry to very experienced avalanche educators, professionals, and guides. Um, there's no requirement on what your experience is to be part of the community. Currently, we only admit individuals. Uh, Sierra Avalanche Center is a member as a center but there's only a couple non-individuals allowed. If you're part of a business or a nonprofit, we encourage you to join as yourself, uh, but, but currently uh, that's how you have to join. Um, the admins try to foster an inclusive environment, uh, whether you're new to snow, uh, backcountry skiing or not. Uh, typically we have monthly happy hours, kickoff parties, organized groups to movies, just ways to get together, a partner finding spreadsheet and uh, lots of ride sharing and partner seeking posts. Next slide, please. Uh, common posts, uh, partner seeking, new to the backcountry, ride sharing, uh, where to get avalanche education and discussion on avalanches. Uh, currently there's a pin post at the top of the page where one group member went through and found all the AAA and area approved avalanche education centers in California and posted a blurb about each one of those. Uh, with links to their pages. Uh, it's a popular post right now. There's lots of gear advice, a typical stoke on the backcountry and trip reports. And our group members tend to go uh, throughout California and beyond. Uh, one thing when you're traveling to snow, you don't mind traveling uh, different places. So there's mainly discussion about Tahoe, but there's also a lot of discussion on the Eastern Sierra, Lassen Volcanic National Park, Mount Shasta, and beyond. Uh, for instance, uh, one group member was looking on information for a winter traverse over several days of the White Mountains, which I found to be uh, pretty interesting and a little exotic compared to most trips where most people go. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Oh, this is an uh, example. And, and just an example of uh, some of our posts. Uh, these were from the last uh, uh, few days, um, four days, I guess. Um, some different things that have been posted. Great. 
Well, I'd like to remind you all that if you want to get questions in, please send them to Megan at TahoeSiliconMountain.com or ask in the YouTube comments. I'm going to leave that up for just a minute before I switch over to a screen where you see all the talking heads and a reminder who we have. We have Andy, who just spoke from San Francisco Backcountry Skiers, David from Sierra Avalanche Center, and Emily from Backcountry Babes. And I'm going to ask them to start with, you know, let's start at the beginning. What's the first thing that you ought to do if you're thinking about getting into backcountry skiing? You want to go first, Andy, since you see so many posts asking that? Yeah, I would say uh, try to meet people. Um, so there's a, a significant starting curve with backcountry skiing. Um, Gear can be rented. I think that's a, a very common uh, question we get is how to do that. Um, so gear can be rented either in the Bay Area or there are several shops in uh, Tahoe and Eastern Sierra, Mount Shasta. Um, go out, maybe uh, we currently have a post about resorts that allow uphill traffic. Maybe just try it out. Um, get used to that, uh, and hire a guide to go out for the day. Uh, that can be an uh, invaluable experience, uh, new to the backcountry. Uh, somebody that knows what they're doing, that knows the safety protocols, that can take you out and have an enjoyable day, uh, rather than sort of the typical significant other trying to teach you how to ski or safety things that, that often doesn't work. There are people out there that can make this a really fun experience for you if you want to try it out. Great. Emily or David, do you want to answer that question? The very first things you should do if you're interested in the backcountry? I mean, the first time I went backcountry skiing uh, with like, I went with a couple friends, but the real first time I went was with Alpine Skills International when I was working at Sugar Bowl. And so um, they now have a very slightly different name uh, but they're still there and they teach beginner backcountry tours. And uh, so do we at Backcountry Babes. So a small group uh, professional instructor who's taught the same concept before. So has some good tics, trips, tips and tricks um, to get you started and to significantly shorten the learning curve. So yeah, as a guide service, I, I think a small group to get you out is a great thing uh, if you can't you know, rope your friends into doing it, or if you just want a professional um, to help make it a little quicker. Great. David, do you want to add anything onto that question? I think that a lot of good, good ideas were shared there. I mean, you need to get the gear and get the training and figure out how you're going to do that, which is going to come first and all that. Um, you certainly can go slow and rent, rent some gear. And there's nothing wrong with like, you know, just biting off something small that's not very avalanche. Um, prone, low angle, maybe not going to get you, you sponsored, but it's fun and it's a good day out. And, you know, choosing appropriate times to take like small little um, bites is a fine way to get started. Great. Well, I'm going to say one more time, Megan, M-E-G-A-N at TahoeSiliconMountain.com or in the YouTube comments to ask a question. And I'm going to stop sharing the slide so that we can see everybody. And the next question is, um, are you seeing evidence of a potential increase in Tahoe area backcountry skiers? Yes, <laughs> I guess I'll go first. So uh, at least within our little group, uh, membership is exploding. Um, I don't know how that will translate to who actually goes, uh, but we are increasing in size significantly. Emily, are you seeing a lot of questions? I mean, I've, I've heard of backlogs where people can't get into classes till February. Yeah, yeah. So our classes are sold out until until February. And usually, usually that does start to happen around this time of the year. Because um, we're a smaller provider, we don't have a ton of classes available. But we saw things fill up last month, um, which is early. And anecdotally, uh, I've heard that the gear sales have been through the roof. So everybody has the equipment. Um, so I think we will see 
a lot of backcountry use this winter. Yeah, I was going to go to gear sales as well as a metric. I mean, the Sierra Avalanche Center, we're kind of downstream of all of this, but we certainly expect a flood of new users. Um, and certainly from the manufacturers that we have communications with, it sounds a little bit like bicycles six months ago when every, you know, all bikes sold out and then people couldn't get them. I think that a similar sort of um, you know, pandemic uh, run on uh, uh, touring equipment is occurring right now. So let's lead that into a question of what is a basic touring setup? What, what do you need to have? I'll take the avalanche stuff. So um, just uh, in terms of the, the gear you need to rescue your companions is a shovel, beacon, and probe and a good backpack to carry it all inside. And so that's like from the avalanche perspective, like, you know, you don't generally need that stuff inbounds at a resort, but if you're traveling in the back country, you should have that and everybody in your party should have that and you should all know how to use it. And even just practicing that is a great way to like, you know, build some skills and stuff. So you don't have to, you know, go to avalanche terrain to practice those. You can just go in behind your, your cabin or house or some meadow or something. So how about what do you need to actually go up? Yeah, and, and just to be clear on the um, safety equipment for the new folks, the, the shovel and the probe can be in your pack, but you're wearing the beacon on your body. That's not going in the pack, right? Thank you for that clarification, yes. <laughs> just, just for the new folks. And um, of those things, is it okay to buy those used? Um, a spe is it okay to buy the beacon used or just the shovel and probe? I think ideally you would buy all of that stuff new. Um, I've certainly broken and seen many probes break over time, not from misuse, just because water gets inside and there's a little rust and corrosion that occurs. Um, and, you know, the, the equipment is expensive, but an emergency room visit is, or worse, is way more expensive. So, you know, if you can all swing it, I would definitely recommend getting new or, you know, um, maybe buying used from a friend who you trust or something. Um, but being a little careful about buying, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure I would buy a used parachute. It would be something similar to that. I'm not a a base jumper, but yeah. Emily and Andy, you want to talk about the rest of the gear setup? I mean, Andy mentioned renting from some of the local shops, either in the Bay or here in the Truckee area. But what all do you need? Uh, I think first I'll talk about the team you go out with. So you need a team of people with you that have uh, uh, some experience um, with common goals for the day. Uh, so you need to have a plan around the day. Uh, know what your objective is, know where you're going, and everybody be aware of that and what the, the conditions are from people like Dave um, around those goals and if that team fits uh, the goals for the day. So I think that's a, an important part of the, the sort of gear for the day. Um, so um, a primary plan and also backup plans in case the conditions are different, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, as maybe I'll let Emily take uh, gear and education. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a little checklist for the gear. So beacon, shovel, probe, phone, wallet, keys, skis, boots, poles, skins, and then, you know, what you wear. So I kind of, I made this like little checklist card that we give out at our beginner backcountry tours. I'm pretty sure there's a blog on our website about it, but um, so your backcountry skis, which you have mounted with your touring bindings, and then your backcountry boots, which you may try to get away with your Alpine boots like one time, and then you'll probably invest and you'll spend the $800 on the boots because uh, they're significantly lighter and more comfortable. And then um, ski poles, so adjustable poles are typical. Um, you could probably get away with just using your resort poles and then kind of uh, gripping down lower on the poles if you wanted to shorten them for any reason. But most people just buy the lighter backcountry poles. And then skins are um, like little carpets that go on the bottom of your skis to give you the traction to go up. So that's like the minimum equipment to get up there. Um, and then a lot of like very first time backcountry skiers, I'll see wearing their resort setup to go out touring and <clears throat> that can get really hot on the uphill. So most people start a little lighter from the uphill, but actually have 
a ton of layers in their backpack for the downhill or in case you stop for lunch or stop for some unexpected reason. And then it does get cold pretty quickly. So big down jacket, Gore-Tex layers, wool long underwear, lightweight socks, two pairs of gloves, sunglasses, baseball hat, um, maybe a backcountry helmet or, or maybe a rock climbing helmet or maybe your Alpine helmet. Um, did I miss anything? <laughs> did, did we cover the split board setup? Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. So I'm biased towards skiing, but a, a lot of people split board <laughs> and a lot of our guides split board. So uh, split board, you can wear your normal snowboarding boots, one benefit, um, and then skins that fit your board touring bindings for the split board Good. and still bring adjustable poles because there's a lot of flats and a lot of traversing. So you really need two poles to get through it. A lot of split borders bring collapsible poles so you can stick them in your backpack. Okay. So back on the skis, we had a question already. Um, what's the optimum width for skis for backcountry skiing? Quiver of one. 112. <laughs> I think that's a good optimistic yeah. you know, midwinter powder sort of hope, right? If it's lots yeah. of soft snow, like something in that ballpark makes sense. In the spring, you probably don't want to be carrying quite such a heavy ski around. Um, but, you know, it, it sort of depends. I think anywhere from mid 90s to like 112 ish, 115, somewhere in there, is my guess. Yeah. Um, another question that came in, um, what do you say to people who want to get into backcountry, but classes are full? What are, um, what are some education op opportunities when the classes are full? Are there continuing ed classes? What kinds of things can people do? Um, I mean, one that you could pick up a copy of Bruce Tremper, Staying Alive in Avalanche Terrain and read it and that can give you a lot of really really good information to work with this season and when you do eventually get into an area level one course you'll have a lot of valuable time, class time having had that good background information i i, I think tremper is my favorite author of this these sorts of things and uh, staying alive in avalanche train is the classic he also made an avalanche essentials book which is shorter um, and uh, Utah Avalanche Center has, I think, a free online course. Um, so there's there are options if you can't get into a, a, a course. And I, I think, you know, I probably went in the backcountry once or twice before I took a level one. I think that there's no law against that. Just be smart and, you know, uh, take responsibility for yourself. I would say just go read the Avalanche Advisory every day. Read the Avalanche Advisory every day, and there's lots of linked words in there. If you see a word that you don't know what it means, look it up. A lot of those words have direct links to what they mean. It will take you to, maybe you'll see the word facet, and you don't know what that is. Uh, you can click on that and go read about facets, and then keep going through to the Trimper book or to other online resources and things, and just try to understand some of this stuff. And just a note on that, um, you can go back and see the historical avalanche advisory. So you can look through all of last year and the year before and the year before that. And so um, just because there aren't uh, full ones published yet for this year doesn't mean you can't go back and, and learn from past years. Um, let's see, next question. How, how do you find people to connect with? Uh, online. Yeah, jo join Facebook groups. Uh, uh, be present in various communities, um, whether it's San Francisco Backcountry Skiers or other groups. Um, just try to connect with like-minded individuals. Um, have conversations. One of the key things in the backcountry is to communicate um, what you're doing for the day, what you want to do for the day, um, so you need to be out there a little bit. I'll put in a quick plug for uh, Holly Yoakum, one of the Sierra Avalanche Center board members uh, wrote an essay in our most recent newsletter and I shared it out on Facebook because I thought it was quite lovely. And I mean, she's just a really nice person, um, but she's notorious um, for bringing cookies and like, you know, making friends at trailheads. I mean, this year might be a little different with that, but you know, I don't know. Um, but being friendly and uh, 
you know, making friends in the backcountry at trailheads, um, in normal times at awareness talks, at shops, at breweries, all these sorts of places. I mean, it, it can be a little bit hard to find a good partner. I mean, it's easier to make a friend than it is to find a good partner. Like Andy mentioned, having a, a high quality team around you is super important and it, you should be a little bit uh, careful putting that together, but just meeting some friends shouldn't be super hard. Um, speaking of Holly, there's also Tahoe Backcountry Women, um, and they do a bunch of meetup events at Alpenglow Sports Shop and um, different, you know, in-person events, maybe not happening this year, but uh, there's also a Facebook group. And so that's a really cool way to meet women in the backcountry as well. And Andy, you guys with your group have a backcountry partner finder Google sheet as, as a way of identifying people, right? Yeah, so uh, somebody else runs that, but there is a sort of partner sheet. Um, so you can find people with more experience or similar experience or that maybe live in a similar area to you or have uh, similar goals to you in the backcountry. Um, and it's, it's really a way to start the conversation for you to build a partner, build a team, um, I've, I've heard backcountry skiing sort of described like internet dating um, and that uh, you don't just immediately meet up with somebody. Uh, you have to have similar goals and desires and backgrounds. And, and that's one way to start looking at that is with the, the partner finder that somebody else on the site uh, maintains. Well, and, and you don't have to start with a big ski either. You can, you know, well, we've got shallow snowpack, do a little getting to know you ski that maybe you don't even peel skins, but just have a chance to get out and check how your communication is. Um, next question. Um, in addition to avalanche education, what other education would you look for in a partner? I think that's a great question. And, you know, I mean, I have taught I think at least a bazillion avalanche classes and it, that information is super important, but other types of knowledge are probably just as equally important. So wilderness first responder, wilderness medicine type training, medical training, you know, stuff happens and um, you need to be prepared for that. The patrol is not gonna come quickly. Um, that is a huge one. And my other one that I'll say before I let someone else talk is land navigation. You know, it's uh, easy to follow a trail in the summer you know, one of the joys about winter is that all that sort of stuff disappears under the, the white snow. And so your, your navigation skills need to be a little bit higher than uh, just for summer, summer purposes. Any amateur meteorologist amongst you? Where, where are you looking for the weather in addition to the avalanche advisory? Well, my, my favorite weather is NOAA, N-O-A-A. Um, and their mountain weather advisory hits on the elevation bands that are good for backcountry skiing and kind of gives a generalized picture um, of what's happening at 7,000 feet and 8,000 feet for the Tahoe region. So that's the Reno uh, NOAA forecast mountain weather advisory. And I think Sierra Avalanche Center links gets their information links to that exact spot, right? Yeah, so the Reno National Weather Service Office does a really good job kind of partnering with the Sierra Avalanche Center, also with ESAC. Um, so if you go to our website, you can kind of use that as a one-stop spot and hit the weather and then, you know, link to their mountain weather uh, statement. And uh, yeah, I, I, I concur. I mean, they're, they're awesome. They're the best. I mean, I read everyone else's like random blog too, but like that's definitely the, the most high quality one you can find, I think. And then the Caltrans webcams are really like yeah. real time info on what's actually happening. They're, they're great for now casting, like what's happening yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah I, I appreciated your comment about the first aid education. Um, I've been injured in the back country. I was not in an avalanche, but I was injured and had to self extract. And I, I think the stats would say there's a lot of injuries and only a small percentage of them are avalanche related. Yeah. I think so. I think the statistics are probably pretty low quality, but certainly that would be my assessment. And I do think it's very important to recognize that even if you, however you're injured, you know, if you're injured at 9,000 feet in the mountains in winter, a relatively minor injury becomes serious quite quickly. Um, you know, I have two friends who were 
hurt in avalanches in the greater Tahoe area in the last couple of years. And they both had, were heli evac and, you know, they had serious injuries, but they, at least in the short term, were most threatened by hypothermia. And it was, you know, a near fatal thing for them. And they were well prepared, but still like, you know, if you are hurt and it's 9,000 feet in the winter on a north facing slope and you're not moving, you're gonna get really cold quickly. And I think that surprised both those individuals and their crews. I'll back that up too. Um, so as sort of a, a weekend, weekend warrior recreationalist, um, I've accidents happen in the backcountry, um, whether they're with you and your group or with other people. Um, I was skiing in the backcountry and another group had uh, an injury. Uh, it was a very moderate slope, uh, a fall. Um, they were in sight of buildings, um, but the terrain to get over it was not trivial. Um, even though they could see where help was, it took four hours for the helicopter to get there and extract them. These things take time. Uh, there is cold. So Emily mentioned carrying the extra gloves, extra emergency layers. Dave just mentioned the hypothermia. These things are out there and uh, it's part of the planning you should be doing. And having that first aid training is very important, whether for avalanches or for other kinds of accidents. A couple pieces of kit related to that quickly. I mean, I, I do carry a um, in-reach uh, communicator device so that I can get a message out even if I don't have cell phone. And certainly when I'm guiding, when I'm working professionally, and sometimes on my personal days, I carry a, a small rescue sled as well um, for dealing with these scenarios. Yeah. Um, Anything else in the in the pack that people should be thinking about from a safety perspective? Okay. Um, so, any tips on how to navigate while in backcountry terrain? So, want to share anything on your wayfinding and how you've learned to use apps or maps or whatever it is that you use? I like to use, um, I mean, my phone, really. I mean, uh, I use Gaia GPS on my, my phone. And if there's any questions, that's my kind of go-to. If I'm more remote and it's a crevassed area, I would have a dedicated GPS. But for Tahoe day trips, um, that uh, GPS mapping software works great. And my phone battery is usually reliable for, with our temps. Um, and it's really quite good. Um, if you know how to use it and you should have a backup in, in case, you know, my phone has died a few dozen times in the back entry, but. F phones get cold. Uh, iPhones are kind of notorious. They will shut down if it's below 25 or 30 degrees. Uh, so, so be prepared for that. Have ways to figure out to warm it up um, or carry an external battery and then have a, a backup map in the, uh, the uh, navigation course was mentioned earlier. Have, if you have a map, uh, which you should, have some skill to use it. Um, yeah, I really like using caltopo.com and they, yeah. they happen to be Trekkie based, um, but they have maps for California and all of North America. And a cool feature is overlaying slope angle shading. So that can be really helpful for getting a broad idea of what the terrain, the steepness of the terrain is. Um, and there's some paper maps that came out last year that I think are really cool for big picture um, lay of the land of where different trailheads are. Uh, they're at all the gear shops, they're at REI, um, and they're folding maps, talking yeah, about so ski maps. Just quickly, yeah, that's, I think, backcountry ski maps. And I think that they now have them for all of the regions in Tahoe. And those are really nice, especially for kind of beginner folks, because there's some good beta on there, like stuff that I certainly didn't know about my first season in Tahoe. So if you're curious, those are great resources. And you should always have a paper kind of backup handy. Um, and then, yeah, my uh, just a second CalTopo, my sort of go-to are, you know, CalTopo for my desktop and Gaia in my phone usually. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the learning curve. I mean, uh, 
a lot of people, I think their impetus for becoming interested this year is they're concerned that they're not going to be able to do as much resort skiing. So if you're an accomplished resort skier, what, what does the learning curve look like for entering the backcountry? Well, a lot of resort skiers who come take our classes for the first time, like really want to go so fast downhill in the backcountry, and we're always like, slow down, milk it, take your time. Every obstacle is unmarked. You don't want to get injured. It's a much more like cruiser experience. Um, so you really want to, I mean, I want to see our clients going slowly in the backcountry. <laughs> I, I concur. I mean, you, there's a time and a place for going fast and opening it up in the backcountry, but it's less than it is in bounds at a resort, right? Again, the patrol's not there. The trees are not padded. The creeks are not like signed. I mean, there's the cliffs are not roped off. Um, so you need to recognize and, and tone it down uh, appropriately. I think one of my hardest transitions was skiing with a backpack. I wasn't, I wasn't used to that. And that's something you can start skiing with a backpack at the resort in preparation to see how that's going to feel differently. Um, so there was a, a question about ham radios in the backcountry. Is that you familiar with that? Does that work out well? Get used a lot. So I would say there are various radio options in the backcountry. Uh, ham is one of them. You need a license for that. Um, so there are ways to do that. Um, there are um, other sort of walkie-talkie options that have various ranges based on uh, what the walkie-talkie is. But there are a series of, of things. And having that communication can be really nice if you're in a dense wooded area or, or somewhere where you're getting out of sight of one another. Um, I, the Motorola sort of um, family radio walkie talkie, like BCA makes one that they sort of market, especially for skiers that is a little bit convenient. And those don't have infinite range, but they're still quite nice and their range is much better than you yelling. And uh, I would just second what Andy said about the forest. I think oftentimes we think of backcountry skiing as something that happens in gnarly Alpine terrain in the European Alps or Alaska, but it's harder to lose your friend when you're in the Alpine. It's easy to lose somebody like low down in the trees, which is a lot of Tahoe skiing. And that's when radios can be very nice. Then, like a interesting thing when you're new to backcountry skiing is how short the pitches are between regrouping. So, you know, at the resort, you go to the first turnoff halfway down the hill, but in backcountry skiing, it might be line of sight. It, if you don't have radios, you might be picking out the exact tree you're gonna stop at. Uh, to not lose each other in the forest. So to the extent you guys are willing to share this, there is a question coming in. If each of you could share a, a favorite spot, um, you know, uh, in, in the region, um, any favorites you're willing to share? My, uh, my favorite is Rubicon Peak and my grandparents had a cabin there when we were little and so go out the back door and ski it all day long, which is super fun and pretty uh, manageable terrain for beginners, intermediate beginners. Yeah. Um, my favorite place in Tahoe to take a new backcountry skier um, is Rubicon. Uh, maybe that's a big climb if somebody's never been out before, but uh, I think it kind of has it all. It's got gorgeous views into Desolation Wilderness when you get to the top. It's got views of the lake. Um, it's got great old growth forests. It's a, a really pretty place. But I would say don't limit yourself to just Tahoe. There are other places in California. There are, uh, we say Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta is not always going to the top. There is lower terrain there. Um, there's Lassa National Park is a, a favorite spot of myself, um, which is mainly intermediate terrain. Uh, we're not skiing on Lassen Peak most of the time. We're on s much smaller pitches uh, spreading out. 
think those are all good suggestions. I think my local uh, general favorite spot would be Desolation Wilderness. Like if you can figure out how to get into it, it's a little bit of extra sweat equity, but especially in this season when we're anticipating some crowds, um, I'm certainly gonna make that effort uh, to get in there and enjoy some of those peaks that are just a little bit further from the car. Um, I know this is a hard question to answer universally, but a question came in. How much avalanche risk is there from cold powdery first snowfall versus dumps? And I know that's that's probably a whole session in itself, but anything we can answer with. Sure. So if we're talking about the conditions that we have right now, um, you know, we mostly have dust on rocks, right? We have a foot or whatever of fresh snow. And so we don't really have um, much layering or things like that. I think there's a small concern about some wind slab way, way high up. But, um, you know, when we have more snow and we have more layers, you sort of envision an Oreo cookie, but with different layers of snow, um, that's what makes us most concerned in terms of serious avalanche problems. So um, later on in the season, um, when I would expect to see that. Although oftentimes early season, we do have some really interesting layering, but we really just have one storm. So we don't have much layering at the moment. Okay, a final question. Um, most important piece of advice may be on etiquette that um, folks maybe don't know the first times that they go out. Any etiquette you'd like to share with the newbies? Be nice to each other. Everybody started sometime. Um, be nice, be inclusive. Um, you know, it's probably, you don't own the mountain probably. Um, and you started one day too. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really nice to get to be able to talk to people on the skin track uh, or people who are coming down who just finished. Like, how was it out there? what did you see? Did you see any, anything interesting? So you can get some good input on conditions uh, or hazards, maybe. Um, learning from people who just came down the slope. Yeah, I would echo both those thoughts. Like uh, for, you know, beginners, I mean, I would encourage people to like let go of their anxiety and, you know, be as prepared as you can be. And then just, you know, own suffering a little bit and making some mistakes we all did. And I, I agree. I think a lot of the, um, the issues are from more of the experienced folks who, who are angry because they perceive someone else as not doing it correctly, but tough luck. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time, Emily, David, and Andy. Um, and looking forward to seeing lots of new folks out in the backcountry this year. And just as a wrap up, I'd like to thank you from Tahoe Silicon Mountain, remind you that we always meet the second Monday of the month and hold our Mountain Minds Monday event. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel and maybe look back at some of our past events. And if you didn't get a chance already um, and are able, a donation of $5 for the event would be wonderful, tahosiliconmountain.com and a donate button in the upper right. And also a reminder that the Sierra Avalanche Center can't have all of their normal fundraisers this year. So um, donations that way would be much appreciated as well. So thank you to our panelists and thank all of you in the audience for participating today. Great questions coming in. And we'll look forward to seeing folks next month. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.